Hi, I'm Anne of All Trades, and today we're going to talk about how to cut dovetails by hand. Before we get started, I would love to give a huge thank you to Woodcraft for sponsoring this video and my channel. I get my hands dirty, they show me no mercy, so I just keep working. I love teaching people how to cut dovetails because contrary to what most of the internet seems to believe, it really is not that difficult. You can use nine tools that most people already have in their garage. Of course, I have a lot more fancy tools and I'm going to use them because I love to, but, but nine basic tools and two square pieces of wood. In fact, I learned how to cut my first dovetails in plywood and the real truth of the matter is dovetails were never supposed to be the woodworking Everest anyway. They were initially created because hand forged nails, by the way, if you haven't already seen it, check out my hand forged nail video, but hand forged nails were so time and labor intensive to make that they needed a cheaper option. So enter the dovetail. It was two triangles cut into wood that would keep it from falling apart. In fact, if you are currently intimidated about cutting dovetails, stop this video, go to an antique store and look inside the drawers because chances are those dovetails and antique furniture are going to look a little something like these. Not really your expert craftsmanship that you're seeing on Instagram's pages today, but hey, this thing's a few hundred years old and it still hasn't fallen apart yet. These are the nine basic tools that you need to cut dovetails. When it comes time to mark out your dovetail joinery, we're going to need a marking gauge. We're going to set it to just over the thickness of your material. Lock it down nice and tight. And you start with a light pass followed by a couple of deepening passes. That just, the deeper the line here, the better registration you'll get from your chisel when you're cutting your joinery. And here we just very, very carefully, very lightly, and we deepen that later. This gives us a stopping line for our saw, and it also helps us to know as we're chiseling out the bottom of the waist where to stop. I like to use my bench hooks here so that I can pull towards myself because pushing the marking gauge away from yourself is very difficult. It's always good to do your warm ups on your bottom board so that these are going to be the less visible uh, dovetails. Always want to make sure that I put my stock square into my vise. We want to eliminate as many variables as possible, and one of those is making sure that we're sawing straight. If the wood is square in the vise, and you're still having problems sawing straight, it's probably your sawing that's an issue, not the other way around. So I'm going to mark out the joinery here. I'm having the back part face me right now with the rabbit cut into it so that I can make sure to mark out my joinery in a way that makes sense. I have my test joint here to make sure that I remember how to do this properly without screwing too many things up. I like to mark my dovetails out with two pairs of dividers. These are going to be my outside pins. And then I'm going to just quickly step this out to make sure that this is the spacing that I'm going to want. That looks pretty good. Let's try one more time here. So I put my, the tip of my marking knife in that and then I slide my dovetail marker up to it. Then again, I just start with a light stroke and then deepen it a couple of times. Put that tip in, slide it over. One little quick tip about those two is that I always want to make that base the exact same width of my chisel so that I don't I only have to make one chop at the end. All right, so now I am all set up to cut my tails, which are the first thing that I cut when I cut dovetails. And I want to cut from the outside of the board in so that if there's any chip out or any little things that happen, it all happens on the inside of the board. So that when it's all glued together, then you're never gonna see any of that on that opposite side there. I have my lines marked on both sides, mostly, mostly as, a guide and I want to before I start cutting mark out all my waist so that I cut 
We don't want any whoopsies there either. Okay, when I am ready to cut my dovetails, I have my piece square in the vise. I have my mutton tallow here. You can use mutton tallow, beeswax, anything. You just wanna lubricate your saw. I have my body in a relaxed position. I have my sawing hand at the ready. I have my body positioned in such a way that I can take all the weight off the back of my saw with my hand placed here. I have my non-dominant foot forward and I'm going to use the radius of my thumb. My arm is free to swing freely here. And so it won't encumber me. My body's out of the way. I have my everything ready to go here. And an easy start. And then I turn my saw. Try to use as much of my saw as possible. Nice and slow, nice and easy. We want to saw all the way down to the baseline on both sides. And I want to do all of my cuts of this direction first. My hand gripping the saw is nice and relaxed. Starting on the push. Now, if I miss my line here, it's totally fine as long as I'm square to the board, as in this is perpendicular to the board, so this is a 90 degree angle. This is the only thing that matters. Your saw could go like this or like this. It doesn't really matter because we're going to make a pattern using this board for the pin board. So again, starting on the push, a nice, gentle, confident stroke. my line all the way down to the baseline. Now this little guy is very short so I want to keep my saw nice and square and I'm going to very carefully saw down to that short baseline. That's that. Now the rest of these will be a breeze. Now I can come in with a coping saw to get rid of that waste in the middle there. And with the coping saw, you only want to take however much you feel comfortable with because you can remove the rest with the chisel later and that is somewhat safer. Anything you can remove with the coping saw is time that you'll save with the chisel later, so. Okay, when it comes time to transfer the pattern that we just made with the tails to the pin board, we're gonna raise the board in the vise, the pin board, up to a equal height with the plane here, and then we're gonna use this to help us make sure everything stays lined up absolutely perfectly. Before I do anything, I'm just gonna quadruple check that these are the same boards that my rabbit lines up. This is the C tails, and so I'm gonna cut them into the C pins. Double check that, and then I'm gonna visually line everything up by eye. Then I'm gonna take my cell phone flashlight and check to make sure that the light that's passing through is even along all of them. That's gonna help me confirm that everything's nice and straight. And then I'm gonna take a square and make sure, make sure, make sure that those line up there and that these line up here. Now I'm gonna take my marking knife and just like we did with the marking gauge, we're gonna do light passes at first, then we will deepen them. And I like to do all of the lines going the same direction at once. Move over to the other side lines. Now we're gonna use a dovetail marker or a square. Light passes so that the blade doesn't follow the grain of the wood. 
and then you can deepen them as you go down. On the pin board, because these are compound angles, I want to make sure to transfer the marks with the marking knife to the back of the board, which will allow me to pair back to the lines should I need to. With the tail board, a pencil mark here is fully sufficient, but these knife lines become really, really helpful if you do end up have to, having to do any adjustments later on. Bring the tail board up and mark all the waste with it sitting right here so we know. When it comes time to cut the pin boards, everything is pretty much the exact same as the tail boards, except instead of keeping things perfectly square across, as with the pins, you wanna keep things perfectly square up and down with these, so that those square pins can fit directly down in here. So again, we're gonna have our body out of the way of the saw, we're gonna lubricate the blade, we're cutting from the outside, the show side, once we've cut down there, we just need to be very, very careful, light touch on the saw. Cut all the way down to our baseline. If we miss things, this, we use a marking knife to mark both sides of the pins so that if we're off slightly, then we can actually use that as a registering point for the chisel and pair that down to the correct spot there. Cutting all the lines that go the same direction first. When it comes time to cut out the waist here, just want to make yourself a path for that, for the coping saw. Get it started and turn as you're coping. And the biggest thing here is that you want to angle the saw towards the, the part that you can see so you don't accidentally cut over where you can't see. So I'm going to very carefully as I approach my line here and then I'm going to look over here. And just wait till that gets freed because you don't want to weaken that other pin by overcutting your line here. When it comes time to chop out your dovetails, you want to have your work centered over the leg of your bench so that you get the most economy out of each blow. If you orient your boards um, so that the inside is facing up, you can actually use each board as its own chopping block. However, you wanna be really careful to support the chisel so that you don't blow through and end up causing yourself a uh, real issue there. I have the pin board and the two tail boards here centered over the bench. I'm going to use a square mallet head with the rounded chisel backs because that will save me from glancing blows, which will cause that to go around. If I were to use a round on round, you're gonna lose, again, more of that economy of your stroke. Another tip is that when you're marking out your pins, if you make your pins the exact width of your chisel at the very bottom or slightly over there, then you will be able to save yourself a whole lot of work chopping back and forth with a smaller chisel. So just a whole lot of time-saving things to get you started and I want to go about three quarters of the way through on the non-showing side with my chisel then I'm going to flip them over and do one final pass through the show side with the chisel so each time you take a pass with your chisel you want to divide the waist in half you don't want to take it all in one fell swoop because if you do you have a high probability of bruising the shoulder of your dovetails once you've divided a few times, you can finally go down to the bottom and take a full pass. Again, only going down about three quarters of the way. I tend to angle the chisel slightly in so that there's actually a little V in the bottom. That's a little dangerous if you're going to plane away a whole bunch of material here, but I like my dovetails to fit nicely and I never plane deeper than my marking gauge line because I want to leave my marking gauge line showing so that it is kind of a bit of a sign that this was hand handmade. If you do do it that way and you make a little interior V groove on the floor of your tails there, you will slightly undercut and therefore reduce the possibility of high points in the middle of your dovetails, which will just make assembly a whole lot easier. 
So this is why it's important to mark the pins with a marking knife as opposed to just leaving the line because now when we're paring down the chisel, we can correct any sawing errors and then use the chisel to straighten everything out so everything can go together nice and smoothly. I start by paring down to the line from a bit of an angle, making sure to keep very good control of my chisel because I don't want to slip and mark the wall there. And once that's off, I can then come down, catch my marking gauge line here, I mean my marking knife line, put pressure on the chisel to pair that back until it's nice and square. When I'm done chopping, I want to check every mating piece for square. I also want to make sure that there's no material sitting proud anywhere in the joint which will stop the dovetails from fully seating when they finally go together. Any offending bits of material will get removed with the chisel and then I'll recheck the whole thing with the square. While I don't like to test fit my joinery, I do want to make sure that everything is going to go together smoothly come final assembly. And to that end, using a fat pencil you can draw a line across the tips of all your pins and gently press the mating boards together. If there are any tails or pins that are still proud, the pencil carbon will transfer to the opposing board and you'll know where you need to remove a little bit of material. It's important though to retest often when doing this because removing material from one area might make another area seat differently. So at this point all of the joinery has been cut and it's now time to do the final assembly. Before glue up, I like to pre-finish the interior of my cases to avoid glue marks and finish absorption errors later on. When you are gluing, you want to get glue on every surface that is going to mate together. It's not super necessary on end grain to long grain connections, but I always say a little extra glue can't hurt. When you're putting the case together, most yellow glues have an open time of about 30 minutes. Well cut dovetails don't need clamps, but it's always nice to have them and everything else that you're going to need at the ready when you get started gluing so that your glue up is no more stressful than it needs to be. I also like to have a piece of wood slightly thinner than my tails ready to use to tap the tails together to make sure that they're fully seated. And then before walking away, I check the whole case for square and then I let the glue sit. Again, you have another 30 minutes or so before you want to mess with anything, but I like to leave it overnight just in case. So, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. A huge thank you to Woodcraft for supporting my channel and making the creation of these kinds of videos a possibility and a reality. And also, if you have never been to a Woodcraft store, you need to go because it's a fantastic place to meet other woodworkers and to talk to expert woodworkers about tools to get hands-on experience and get questions answered. A lot of Woodcraft stores also have classes that they offer. And here in Seattle, my favorite Wood Instructor of All Time offers the coolest classes. So if you're local to Seattle, make sure you go check out a class with Steve Dando. Wait, 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 the best part's coming. Also, if you would like a Fluffy Crew t-shirt like Rigby has, then go ahead and click the link below. I hope you leave this video feeling challenged, inspired, and excited to get outside and to do things with your own hands as well. Cheers. These are the tools that I use in my shop when I'm cutting dovetails. I have two different sizes of Lee Nielsen chisels. I have a coping saw made by Blue Spruce Toolworks. I have a Hamilton marking gauge, a Sterling Toolworks dovetail marker, and it's a 1-7 ratio. Let's not get into that debate, but I will say that I just love the 1-7 ratio because I think that it looks a lot more handmade, and I think that 1-4 dovetails are a little clunky looking, but that's totally a personal opinion. I also have a Sterling Toolworks dovetail square, which is really handy dandy, especially if you're doing fine pins to really get down into the pins and check for square. A Glenn Drake Toolworks kerf starter, a Florup Toolworks dovetail saw, a fancy pencil, a blue spruce mallet, a, excuse me little baba, a Borman furniture marking knife, and one big and one small set of dividers.